Thank, thanks very much, Emily and Steve, for inviting me. And it's great to be here and see a lot of friendly faces again. Um, so I want to do a couple things today, and I'll, I'll try and fit within my time. Um, I want to put this into context, what, what we're doing with brain stimulation, what the sort of deeper themes are to how we got to where we are now and where we should be headed. There's a lot of different aspects to that. Um, some of it's very personal to me and in ways that I didn't expect when I started doing TDCS that it would turn into a very personal thing, but it has. Um, I have a sick child and they've been sick since about the time I came here in 2010. And um, I'll, I'll tell you in a second what's happened with Ryan, but in general, it's made me look very closely at the state of modern healthcare. And there's a lot of issues here. Um, one of them is really what I, what I consider an over-dependence on the use of pharmaceuticals as a treatment modality. It's easy, there's a lot of money there, a lot of support in some ways, but in other ways, pharmaceuticals can be very dangerous. Um, roughly 40,000 people a year die from drug overdoses. Now, a lot of that is recreational, but not all of it. Some of it is, you know, prescribed by a doctor, go home, take the drug the wrong way or have an unseen side effect and the person passes away. Um, we spend together about a third of a billion or trillion dollars a year on pharmaceuticals. That's a lot of money. It takes about $5 billion per drug that comes to market. That's how much pharmaceutical companies spend and we pay for that. that that's money from our pockets. Um, on the average, prescription drugs have about 70 side effects. Now, most of those are spurious correlations that have to be reported, but often they're real correlations. Some people have side effects, and sometimes the side effects are worse than the symptoms that they're trying to deal with. Altogether, we spend about $3 trillion a year on healthcare in this country, and we're not that much healthier. I could go on for a long time about this. There's a lot of problems here. We need other solutions besides the ones we have. And I think that neuroenhancement, TDCS, uh, other related technologies could potentially be part of that solution. So this is a picture of my son, Ryan. And Ryan got a syndrome, syndrome called complex regional pain syndrome. He um, twisted his ankle. His ankle got better, but a few weeks later, the pain came back and it didn't go away. And this is a picture of Ryan's legs. And you notice that um, the leg you see on the right is a different color than the one on the left. That's a part of the syndrome. When he hurts himself, his body shuts down blood flow to that area. That lets cytokines, histamine, all those nasty chemicals build up. And they actually cause a secondary pain issue on top of whatever caused the pain issue to begin with. It's a really difficult syndrome. It's been tough for him tough for his parents, tough for all of us. The doctors, very good people, very nice people, they really wanted the best for Ryan, put him on some medications. And a few months later, he started to get these episodes. He would just collapse spontaneously and go into spasms. They could go from a few minutes to hours at a time. Sometimes he would get dystonia where his body would completely lock up, he'd be unable to move. It got really scary when he had trouble breathing and we checked him into the hospital. When he was in the hospital, the doctors ran their tests and basically said it must be psychogenic. And psychogenic is a code word for the kids a little bonkers. They thought it was all mental. We weren't convinced though. This is a very sane, very bright kid. We took him off his medications and it turned out to be a side effect of one of the medications he's on called uh, amitriptyline. Um, and he's actually very sensitive. He actually gets these kind of symptoms to a lot of different medications. So as of today, he's pretty much medication free, at least in terms of uh, uh, prescription allopathic medication. Um, but we needed another alternative for him. And he still has a lot of uh, issues, he, he gets relapses. He'll hurt himself, he'll go back on crutches in a wheelchair, whatever. 
And we can't give him drugs now, but he needs help. It, he needs a way to get over that pain. It turns out that there uh, is this really interesting, unexpected benefit to simply biting down on a stack of tongue depressors. So this is Ryan. And um, I have some movies here. Uh, let's see. So Ryan had been in a wheelchair for about a month before this movie that you see here. We just gave him a stack of tongue depressors to bite down on. And this was literally the first time he walked for a month. It seemed incredible, but it turns out that I think there's a, there's a, a benefit to this that's been completely overlooked by modern medicine. Now, it's very old. You remember a long time ago, before anesthesia, they would give people something to bite on when they did surgery. The assumption was that so you didn't bite down so hard that you break your teeth. It turns out there's a brain effect of biting, separate from any of that. It causes analgesia, and it can correct a lot of symptoms of motor syndromes that are currently really untreatable by modern medicine. Um, so this is Ryan a couple days later, and we actually built him a little mouth guard that you'll see in a second he, he, he has in his mouth. And at, at this point, he was getting better. You notice the color change starting to go away in his leg. And within a few days, he, could re he resumed physical therapy, and he was completely out of the wheelchair within, within a week or so. so it was just a spectacular change, completely without medication, and it, very effective. And now, you know, he, he still has bad days, but he has a lot of good days, too. There's other symptoms that this helps with. Um, My symptoms were twitching, by barking noises, I twitch my neck back and forth, cause myself whiplash. I mean... You, I've always wanted to look at, looked at people and just wishing that I could just stay still. So, oops. so, so that's a, a young man with Tourette syndrome. And in the beginning uh, was before he got a, a mouth guard and afterwards was after he was treated by a dentist for some TMJ issues. And his Tourette's basically disappeared with, with the use of that mouth guard. Um, then there's a... a Another story, this, this woman, after a uh, car accident, developed some really nasty issues with muscle control. She had a lot of trouble walking. And this is the first time she tried just biting on a stack of tongue depressors. And just immediately, that problem resolved. Again, she'd been to dozens of doctors. Neurologists like to call her syndrome psychogenic. They think it's psychological, and it may be, I can't say. But why would she respond to this when she hadn't responded to the last umpteen doctor visits that she'd been to? Why? What's so special about biting down? And there's many other patients too. I can show you dozens of examples, individual examples of patients that benefited. This, uh, this fellow had uh, blepharospasm. It's basically dystonia of the eyelids, very hard to open his eyes. When he puts something in his mouth and bites down, his eyes just pop open. And that look of surprise is basically just opening his eyes, but also being surprised that it works, you know. Um, this is a, a fellow who, after, also after an accident, um, had to use a cane most of the time. He put a stack of tongue depressors in, and he threw down his cane. <laughs> And it's just like being in a revival meeting when we get <laughs> patients in. I, it's incredible. Um, here's, here's another fellow with uh, Tourette's and, and with a mouth guard. It's hard to see a little bit because it's taken from a movie. But um, again, it resolved. He was on, I think, eight or 12 different drugs at this point. With a mouth guard, he doesn't need them. Um, this is a woman uh, also who, who had a lot of issues. She actually had... Uh, pain syndrome, much like my son Ryan's. And for her, it progressed to this really advanced state where she get all tied up. And with tongue depressors, she just loosens up and can walk and, and, uh, and so on. So 
I'm intrigued. <laughs> um, we're doing some imaging studies. And uh, like TDCS, it's hard to come up with a control. But one thing we've come up with is different thicknesses of mouth guards. It turns out that a thin enough mouth guard is basically ineffective. It doesn't produce this benefit. So we try different sizes of mouth guards. We're doing imaging studies. One of the things we've noticed is that with thicker mouth guards, you tend to see this effect in the cerebellum um, that isn't there with thinner mouth guards or when people don't have anything at all in their mouth. So that's one piece of evidence that it's, it's altering brain networks. Biting down alters brain networks. Um, this is the result of a larger study, uh, a total of 12 patients and a few healthy controls mixed in to, to increase the N. Um, this is the interaction of the effect of performing a voluntary movement by rest with biting down on something in your mouth, either tongue depressors or a mouth guard versus relaxation. So two by two design. This is the interaction between, between those two, um, significant with an FDR of 0.05. And you see a lot of brain areas alter their response depending on whether or not you're biting down. Um, it's interesting. And we published a, a little paper about this just to get the di idea out. We're finishing up that imaging study. We'll, we'll publish that as soon as we can. So the summary of all this, just to begin, um, Applying pressure to the face and jaw produces some really interesting effects on pain and motor behavior. There's a variety of modalities out there which can influence the nervous system, aside from drugs, but also aside from TDCS. So in a broader context, TDCS is a non-pharmacological way to interact with the nervous system, but there's even more than that out there. And we should, we should be thinking about that. As we move forward, you know, TDCS is one way to do this. There's a growing number of methods producing, for producing changes or enhancements in the nervous system. So now I want to get really sort of broad. How, how does this fit into the whole human milieu, what we're doing? How important are enhancements to, to our species? How different are cognitive enhancements than other forms of physical enhancement that humans have developed? Um, how are neuroenhancements different than other forms of cognitive enhancement? And what forms of cognition can be looked at with or influence with TDCS? And what conclusions can we draw from all this? So how important are enhancements to our survival? I would say that enhancements are what we as a species are remarkably good at. Without enhancements, we would be naked. We would be walking on our feet uh, over whatever's out there. We'd live under trees and caves. We'd be hungry most of the time, and medicine would be limited to what we could find growing or whatever. And basically, basically, <laughs> we'd be in serious trouble. We'd be like this, you know. <laughs> the Simpsons are okay anywhere, <laughs> you know, if you watch The Simpsons. But, but we're an incredibly poorly adapted species compared to other species. We lost our fur. We need that stuff, you know. We, that's why we developed this, because we lost our fur. Um, we need our enhancements. Okay. Here's other examples of physical enhancements for locomotion. And I, I just show a few. But there's a lot of them. And without them, we'd be limited to walking. How far can you really get walking? You know, it turns out you can actually get pretty far, but it would limit us in an incredibly fundamental way. And where would we be without them? You know, <laughs> um, if, if we lost any one of them, our lives would be very different. So cognitive enhancements I see as a form of enhancement similar to physical enhancements. We've developed a lot of cognitive enhancements as well. Enhancements for memory, um, our sensory modalities, vision and audition especially. Um, you can also think of sort of chemical sensors as an enhancement of our taste or smell. Um, there's, there's different imaging methods sort of fit in here. I, I see them sort of as an extension of our, of our visual capabilities. Where does EEG fit in? I've been thinking about that. and, and um, if you look at Hans Berger's life, the, the fellow who discovered EEG in humans, um, 
he was probably interested at some point in enhancing psychic ability. You know, that, that's what Dr. Berger was really interested in. Um, I'm sure he thought about it at some point. But communications, a big enhancement, one we owe a lot to, a lot to is writing. But that is a cognitive enhancer for the human species. We learn to write, to communicate over time, over space, to store information that we could recall later. That's what writing does for us. It's huge. Now, there's one enhancement that's missing here. Can anyone think of what that might be? Living in this part of the world, it's kind of important. Wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, cognitive enhancement of my, of my peculiar, yeah. <laughs> we love that one. OK, thank you. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute, actually. But anything else? Um, computers. Yes, computers. The largest, most effective, most amazing cognitive enhancer ever developed by the human race that parallels writing, I think, and how much it's going to influence us. We're only a few years into this, and oh my gosh, what's happened, you know? I look at movies now that were pre-computer age and how different people's lives were back then, how simpler in some ways, but just totally different. And without cell phones, without all that stuff. So neural enhancement is a form of cognitive enhancement that's a little bit different. Instead of being an external tool, it acts directly on the nervous system to produce some kind of benefit. In this broader context, that's what they are. Any cognitive enhancer actually changes the nervous system. You have to learn how to use it. Your nervous system changes when you learn how to read and write. Your nervous system changes when you learn how to use a computer. By definition, it has to for you to learn. How it changes depends on your interaction with that thing. So neuroenhancers are basically defined mostly as neuropharmaceuticals, so pharmaceuticals that act on the nervous system. Nicotine, caffeine, I forgot alcohol, sorry, but that's our favorite. Um, L-dopa, psychedelics, you know, neuroenhancement in the 60s, the 80s, and cannabinoids are really taken over today, you know, but... Um, but they're not the only form of neuroenhancement. There's also biofeedback and neurofeedback, alternative medical approaches like mindfulness, acupuncture, acupressure. What, what I'm working with with these mouth guards maybe is a form of acupressure. Maybe it can be considered a, 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 an undiscovered, as near as I can tell, example of how pressure on the body interacts with the nervous system. Um, and neurostimulation. And, we're here today because of TDCS, but this is a tiny part of something much, much larger and very essential to our species. So when people cast dispersions on TDCS, on neurostimulation, on neuroenhancement, I say, look at the rest of your life. That's all it's about, our enhancers of various kinds. It's nothing new. Don't be scared. You've been doing this your whole life. Our species has done it for at least 10,000 years, if not much longer. So TDCS itself is growing by leaps and bounds lately. No one's shown, I, I think, a graph like this yet today, but it needs to be shown. In the last decade, it's really taken off. Um, and I assume it'll continue to do so unless something better comes along. So our work in TDCS um, has to do with enhancing perception and learning. And we've had a number of papers come out the last couple of years. So the task we took on was getting people to learn to recognize objects that were hidden in a complex visual scene. And this was a DOD funded project where they wanted, excuse me, to see if they could get people to learn more quickly. Um, the DOD spends billions of dollars on training every year because people come in for a few years and leave, they have to retrain very frequently. They wanted to see if there's a way to reduce this cost. Since it was DOD, I look for an interesting visual, perceptual, attentional task that the DOD might be interested in. And what I hit on was looking uh, at how people identify camouflaged objects, which is really understudied in my view, because I think it's also very important to us as a species. Um, so we developed a camouflaged object discovery learning task. Discovery learning is very difficult. You don't give your subject a lot of information. You give them the task, but you don't give them any clues. They have to figure it out for themselves. 
We designed this to be a difficult task, not an easy task. We did a multimodal imaging study using the stimuli. We found brain regions that seemed to be involved in learning to identify camouflaged objects. We applied TDCS to those regions. And then we looked at the results. And since then, we've done a number of follow-up studies trying to understand more about how TDCS does what it does. And it actually does it very well. So here's some examples of stimuli. If you saw my talk three years ago, um, <laughs> don't shout out, but does anyone see what the camouflage threat might be in this picture? Just shout out if you think. What? The what? Oh, yes. No. Where? Uh, by the, to the right of the tree. Or the Very good. Yeah, there's a little gun sticking out there. It's hard to see, but it's there. There's something here, too. Does anyone see it? Yeah? There's a shadow. From the, from the roof line, this? Yeah. That's very good. People, it's hard for people to see. Did you do radiology residency, too? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no? <laughs> Shooter video games. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. There you go. We actually had to exclude people that spent too much time on video games because they, they just picked it up way too quickly. So. Um, so, yeah, that's right. There's a shadow there that's a sniper on the roof line above you. Um, here's the last one. Any, any ideas? I remember this from before. Yeah, you remember. Yeah, okay. So, single trial learning, right? So, okay. A bomb under the car. Yeah, a bomb under the car, right. Okay. So, those are some examples. So, the learning trials themselves were presenting a static picture like I just showed you. And, again, there's a threat here. Can anyone see it? It's a little harder to see because it's smaller. But again, there's a shadow along the roof line right there. So there's a sniper. If the subject sees this picture and says, no, I don't see a threat, and it makes that response, it's a binary yes, no response, either the threat's there or not, um, then all they got for feedback was a movie that showed the bad thing happening, whatever it might be. In this case, it's a sniper. <coughs> That's all the information they get. They have to remember what they just saw, think, oh, there must be a sniper there. The next time they see a similar image, they have to recall that trial. That's how they learned in this task. And it takes a while. So this shows uh, the level of accuracy averaged over seven of the earlier subjects in our study um, during each 15-minute training block. So four of these blocks equal one hour. So with one hour of training, they go from 50%, which is basically random, 50% is like flipping a coin, up to about 75% accuracy after an hour's training. Um, then we did an imaging study. We uh, imaged their responses to stimuli before they ever saw them, the first time they saw them, when they're novices. Then um, after training to about 78% accuracy, so around an hour's training. It varies person to person. And this is the difference between the object present and object absent stimuli. And you see that with training, the response changes quite a bit. So, um, and this shows the effect of learning as uh, in an analysis of variance. And some regions really popped out. One of them was right mid frontal gyrus. Um, Another one was uh, right parietal cortex, right inferior parietal lobe here. Um, also right cingulate and uh, medial frontal gyrus bilaterally. So we could get TDCS electrodes close to right middle frontal gyrus and right inferior parietal lobe. And we then, we then put a, an electrode over that. And this, this was a cover of the journal Neuroimage, that they had a special issue on neuroergonomics. And they gave us the cover. Um, this is Brian Kaufman, one of my graduate students. Um, by the way, Brian's about to graduate, and he's very good. He's very bright. If you're looking, <laughs> a little advertising, but if you're looking, I, I, I think Brian will do OK, and I'd like to see him in a good place. So if you're looking for somebody, let us know. But um, we put electrodes on. Um, you can see back here, there's two boxes that generate the TDCS current, and they're attached to a, a blinding box. And it's actually double blind. So this box is coded, 
with a switch, and you can't tell which of the two generator boxes it's hooked up to. We set one generator box to 2 milliamps, the other to 0.1 milliamp, and it's double blind as much as you can do with TDCS. The effect over training was, was pretty substantial, that from one training block to the next, the group receiving 2 milliamps was learning more quickly and by the end of the time had achieved a significantly better performance than the group receiving 0.1 milliamp. When we first got this, I didn't believe it. I didn't think that two milliamps of current could really have this profound an effect on learning. I wanted to know if it was real, so I had a lot of questions. Does the effect replicate? Is there a dose response effect that you might expect if you know, a little TDCS does something, more should do more? Um, does it matter where you put the electrodes? Does blinding matter? Do artifacts of TDCS matter, like the stimulation you get on your scalp from, from having a TDCS electrode up there? How long do the effects last? And um, what cognitive effects of TDCS explain this learning effect? So with regards to the effect of current location um, or, or electrode location and current strength, there was an effect that basically a linear effect of current and um, the more current they received, the more they learned um, on an almost exactly linear basis. I think the R value was 0.37. And that was still true an hour later. So the effect lasted at least an hour. So it went from an 87% improvement immediately after training to over 100% improvement after an hour. We also tried electrodes over um, temporal cortex, and we found that actually, when we put the electrodes over T5 or T6, there was almost no benefit of TDCS. It was only when it was over frontal parietal cortex. Um, we replicated and got pretty much the same results in a separate group of subjects. Um, we replicated again um, in a new study comparing single versus double blinding and basically didn't see any significant effects of single versus double blinding here. That's not to say you'd never see it. It's always better to do double blinding if you can, but we didn't find a reason to do it. We didn't see an effect of blinding. Um, let's see. So that's, that's published. Um, we also looked at a 24-hour delay and, again, see that the effect lasts at least 24 hours after stimulation. Um, so this is the effect on hit rate. The 2 milliamp bar is red, the 0.1 milliamp bar is white. Um, false alarm rate, false alarms are cut by roughly half with TDCS. And D prime, a signal detection measure, almost doubles. So there's big effects here and they're significant and they last at least 24 hours. Now, whether or not there's still a, a neurophysiological effect after 24 hours, I can't say with this data. I suspect that at this point, they've simply learned to do the task better, and by the next day, that learning remains just like it normally would. That's my suspicion. It's possible there's an effect that lasts a long time um, at the you know, physiological effect, but I, I can't say. So this compares all those studies plus Another study, we tried cathodal stimulation of T5 and found an increase with that as well. So anodal current applied to uh, parietal or frontal, right parietal, right frontal cortex at 2 milliamps produced more learning than 0.1 milliamp at those same locations. And uh, cathodal current over temporal cortex also increased learning. So there's this nice replication, and it's across three different laboratories, three different electrode sites, two different polarities. A fairly robust finding. What it seems to be is that if we stimulate in areas that show an increase in activity with learning to detect these objects, we see enhanced learning. If we stimulate areas or um, that, show, that show a decrease with learning, we see the opposite effect. And if we, if we put the cathode, that is, assumably, reduce activity in those same areas, we increase learning again. 
Also, we were interested, are there neurochemical effects? So we did a spectroscopy study, and we found, we, we put an electrode over right parietal cortex, and then a, a, obtained spectroscopy from underneath that location and in the opposite left parietal hemisphere. So we had, we had two voxels that we looked at before stimulation and after, then we compared them. And there was a significant increase in the combination of glutamate and glutamine under the electrode, but not a, a small increase, but not significant in the opposite hemisphere. And an increase in N acetyl aspartate under the electrode, but a, a slight decrease in the opposite hemisphere in a significant interaction between hemispheres. We didn't see any effect of skin stimulation. So it turns out that this 0.1 milliamp current still produces tingling, um, heat, and so on on the scalp. And a novice that's never received TDCS really can't tell the difference between low and high current in, in our laboratory. Um, we also didn't see any relationship between um, itching, heat, tingling, and learning. So that somatic stimulation didn't seem to account for what we're seeing. We also looked at uh, another task. So we used the, the ANT task, which looks at alerting, orienting, and executive attention. And we saw a significant effect of the frontal, right frontal TDCS protocol on alerting. So, and then we compare that to learning, and we found that um, both in immediate and delayed testing, a relationship between the alerting effect in the ant task and the amount of learning. So it appears that maybe part of this effect has to do with enhancing attention. We also have done some imaging studies to look at what parts of the brain are, are influenced, um, aside from the spectroscopy. And we've tried uh, fMRI and MEG. And in both cases, we see uh, an increased level of activity underneath the electrode um, immediately after stimulation, suggesting that there, there is an effect on brain function by TDCS. Also, we were interested in modeling current. So, so I asked Marome and uh, his postdoc, Alexander David, and they modeled this right frontal uh, anode versus left arm cathode um, situation. And lo and behold, the model showed increased activity underneath the anode, which is what we hoped for and expected. And that correlates pretty well with, with the data we get from imaging. But there's a lot more to the story, unfortunately to some degree, but we should expect it as well there are deeper effects of TDCS that are as large or even larger than that surface effect underneath the electrode. So down here in the corpus striatum, there's some effects. Way down here in the spinal cord, probably where the uh, innervation of the arm is maybe, I'm not sure actually, but that might be where that is, shows relatively large um, uh, effects. And if you look from the top of the brain down to the bottom, there's a number of areas that are responding to the stimulation. So it's actually quite broad and, and even goes to the very deepest part of the cerebellum. So what does this mean? It could mean that at least some of the cognitive effects we get with this protocol are actually occurring because we're stimulating the cerebellum or some other brain region. It's possible. So what Marom and I are talking about now is where can we put the electrodes to say focus on the cerebellum but leave these other brain areas alone and see, do we still get an effect? That would be a big change in our interpretation of our data, but the truth holds out, and I would rather understand what's going on than try and protect uh, some simple idea. Yeah? So no concern with the idea of stimulating lower brain regions important for autonomic function? Yeah, although in, if, with this protocol, people don't feel very different. They really I, I asked them left and right, how do you feel? Aside from that, though, have you recorded heart rates? We haven't. Measurements? No, but we're gearing up to do that. I, so I'm director of a new center at, at the University of New Mexico. We have a lot of new equipment. That's part of what we're going to do, actually, is, uh, is apply, uh, look at EEG, uh, uh, heart rate, 
respiration and so on and see what effects there are. Well, because I think that would be critical for understanding the safety of doing a stimulation of this sort for lower brain regions. Uh-huh. That's fine, but we've looked pretty closely at people without applying electrodes. Their heart rate isn't going up, at least not remarkably. Their respiration doesn't go up. A lot of them don't even know we're stimulating. And the double blind, aside from a little more stimulation on the scalp, it's, it is hard to tell. A and the fact they do a lot better at the task. You know. <laughs> Um, I'm not that worried, but we will get that data. I, I'd be interested to see what effects there are, even if it's small. I'd like to know. Yeah. Uh, I see on this picture the color code uh, in terms of potential, in terms of uh, voltage. Uh huh. So, uh, so the most uh, stimulated area, you consider the deepest color, or you consider the the the, the biggest color change, because. If you're thinking about the stimulation, you, you want the strongest current, that will yeah. be the... Yeah, so, so Marom can correct me, but, but I believe this is volts per meter. So change in voltage over meter, is that a good interpretation? So it is a rate of change in a sense. Um, a region that has a lot of change versus one that has less wouldn't necessarily be the source of a... Of a of an effect as much as a region showing a, a large change within itself. I think. Is that, <laughs> would you say so? I don't know. Yeah, I think you, yeah, you both said it's, yeah, the, the, the plots are, are volts per meter at the electric field, Yeah. not, not volts. And so um, where you have the hotter color, you would expect more polarization. So I think what you're asking, though, is this region with a lot of hot color versus not so much. Would you expect any special phenomena at that border? Or not? Yeah, and my question is the stimulated area are, are the color or the, the boundary between colors. Yeah. So, with, like, where where I'm pointing, where it was pointing, like like so wherever. If it's uniformly deep color. I would think there where there will be not much current going through a distant voxel because the potential are uniform. Uh, I, I would think. No, no, no. Well. No. No, okay. there'd be more, right? So, so yeah, a dark, a, like a dark red would be 0.3 volts changing per meter. Okay, that's the change. That's the. the it's yeah. it's like a derivative in a sense. So yeah. yeah. So the, so the, I would think the the color code is the is the derivative instead of the the voltage. Yeah, volt voltage. It's a difference. It's a difference measure. So the larger the color, the more difference there is. Yeah, okay. like okay. a derivative. I got yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have you modeled your uh, negative temporal control site and looked at uh, comparison of that map versus this map to give you any inferences about whether structures like the cerebellum? Or yeah, actually, I didn't show it here, but but yes, and the cerebellum is similarly affected in that case, but with the opposite polarity, right? Because the the current's going the opposite direction. So yeah, so yeah, and that that led to my concern. Ooh, maybe this is cerebellum, you know. <laughs> so that's why we're going to look at that and see. I don't know yet. It's it's a hypothesis. It it it's science at its core. We have a hypothesis. We're going to test and see. Yeah. First question was: Were you done with your lecture before we all started asking you questions? <laughs> <laughs> because I have questions, but if you're not, I'll wait till the end. Yeah. Well, we'll have time pretty soon as a group too. But yeah. Um, well, let me move on, because I do have a few other things. There's another example, besides what I just showed, of potential far effects of TDCS. And we've talked about it a bit today. Um, there's a paper by O'Shea in NeuroImage um, where they wanted to compare a, a bilateral uh, anode-cathode um, placement for treating stroke. Um, and in this case, it didn't work, and it's a negative finding. So uh, anode over the unaffected hemisphere, cathode over, no, sorry, anode over <laughs> the affected hemisphere, cathode over the unaffected hemisphere didn't produce an effect, whereas um, uh, cathode over uh, unaffected hemisphere against orbitofrontal cortex did have an effect, and the opposite had an effect. 
And that's just illustrated here. You know, they, they, they combined those two protocols thinking that they might be additive, but in fact, they didn't work. One possibility is that there may be some distant effects either at orbital frontal cortex or between motor cortex and orbital frontal cortex that produces this effect. You always have to consider both electrodes. It's so easy to disregard one or the other, and we just have to be more careful than that, I think, to really understand what we're doing. So the basic question, are these effects real? Does it replicate? Yes. Is there a dose response effect? Yes. Does electrode position matter? Apparently so. Does blinding matter? Not really, not that we can tell. Um, I've thought of another study where we actually lie to people and tell them they're getting stimulated when they're not and vice versa, see what that does. I'd, I'd be interested to know how much does their cognitive mindset affect their response. So far it doesn't look like much at all, which is really surprising to me actually, because it typically has a big effect. Do artifacts on, on the skin matter? No. Um, how long do, you, do the effects last? At least 24 hours. And are there cognitive or neurophysiological effects that can explain these behavioral effects? Maybe. We see an increase in glutamate, glutamine. We see an effect on attention. Those two things together could go a long way to explain why people are learning more in this task. So what's next? We're looking at different electrode placements. We're gearing up to do that cerebellar study to see if that has an effect. We're funded to look in two different studies to look at developing treatments for schizophrenia. We're currently looking at uh, TDCS as a treatment for alcoholism and um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder of which there's an unfortunately large number of children in New Mexico that, that, whose mothers have been drinking. A lot of cognitive problems. We want to see if we can help them. We've submitted grants to look at enhancing adaptive reasoning and problem solving, and we should hear about that in a couple weeks. Other forms of addiction treatment and um, treatments for traumatic brain injury, we should also hear about pretty soon. I have a number of really good students, besides Brian, and they're all applying TDCS in different ways. Fetal alcohol syndrome, schizophrenia, and one of my students is interested, can you apply TDCS in the classroom? And basically a real world application. Um, we're looking at other forms of brain stimulation. Um, we're looking at ways to empirically see where current is flowing. The models are great. They're very informative. I personally distrust models to the point that you, you don't understand the materials you're working with perfectly. Because of that lack of understanding, the model could be wrong. Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. There's only one way to find out, and that's to get the best possible data you can and see if things change. So we're looking at ways to do that. We're looking for other non-invasive ways to influence brain function. The, the mouth guards that I told you about. Besides the mouth guards, I found anecdotal evidence for up to a dozen other relatively simple, cheap, easy ways to influence the nervous system. We're so centered on pharmacology that we're missing a lot of potential solutions to problems, I think. And the mere fact that they're so simple, so easy, makes it easy to discount them. We think that only complicated, expensive solutions are going to do the job. As a group, as a culture, we become so invested in technology, we forget that sometimes the simple solution is best. It's who we are. It's gotten us this far. We've gone to the moon. Incredible stuff. And I love technology. I'm not against it. It's just because it's complicated doesn't make it good. In fact, that's a detriment. If it's expensive, complicated, and dangerous, you want to think twice before you give it to your patient. And we do it all the time, and our patients get hurt. We need to rethink that. So what else is going on? Um, I just put together, along with Raja Parasuraman, a, another special issue of neuroimage on neuroenhancement. And I apologize to everyone in this room that should have been included, but my son relapsed right when I was putting it together, and I lost my focus. So it's not as big or as extensive or as, as cool as I would have hoped. There's a lot of good things here, um, and I am excited about it. One summary over all, all of the papers in there um, is that um, 
the effect sizes for TDCS, if you, if you look across different forms of cognitive enhancement, the average effect size is about 0.9. It's a reasonable effect size. Um, in some cases, it's much larger. You, effect size is up to two and a half. So two and a half standard deviations, that's pretty big. Um, but 0.9, it's reasonable. So there's that. Um, some conclusions from the special issue. Neuroenhancement, I think, can be seen as the latest example of enhancement tools that stretch back for millennia. It defines our species. Without enhancements, we're naked, cold, and gonna die really soon. It, it's important to us, and we need to respect that. We need to accept it. It's who we are. We do it all the time. I think cognitive neuroscience, after, after decades of heavy investment in trying to understand how the brain works, we might be at the point now where we can use that information to benefit ourselves, to go back and influence those processes that we've been characterizing for so long. I think we're, we're reaching that stage. And this neuroenhancement work really proves that. The successes based on theory show that the theory is likely correct, or at least it doesn't invalidate it. Okay. I think that combining modalities is proving to be more beneficial than a single modality alone. So um, combining behavioral manipulations with stimulation is better than stimulation alone. Although it's super interesting, Dylan, about, about how concurrent doesn't work quite as well. I think that's fascinating, and I'd, I'd love to understand why. But in most cases, concurrent works better, <laughs> in my experience, but I haven't tried that much non-concurrent stim stimulation and behavioral. Um, combining imaging and stimulation together can help both. So you can use stimulation to, to test theories that you derive from imaging, and you can use imaging data to plan your stimulation studies. So I think they make a good team. And I'd like to see the imaging community take up stimulation even more so than it has. Because I think there's benefits all around. In general, there's a need for large-scale, multi-center, controlled, randomized studies, of which there have been very few, really, so far, to validate and perfect these neuroenhancement techniques. It's really necessary. Now there's a problem here. Pharmaceutical companies get a third of a trillion dollars a year to do what they do. They have a lot of money to spend on this sort of thing. A cheap, simple device like TDCS, there's just not a lot of money to spend on large-scale clinical phase whatever trials. The resources aren't there to do it. We have to convince NIH, we have to convince the whole medical culture that they really, we need to think about cheaper, potentially safer ways to be treating patients. And we need to verify that. We need to put the effort into it. Otherwise, we'll never get that benefit. Otherwise, kids like my son will wind up back in the hospital. And that's unacceptable to me. I've seen what it's like. So besides that, one thing that makes comparison across studies is that we don't use common methods. And this is a ubiquitous problem in imaging, in a lot of science, each lab develops its, its own favorite method of doing things. In a way, that's okay, because it gives you variety. And you can see the same question from different angles. But it makes comparison very difficult. Another thing that makes comparison difficult is the lack of common reporting measures. Some of these papers don't even include statistics, or they hide them. That's not helpful. <laughs> um, effect size is a very useful metric to compare across studies. Um, having a blinded sham control condition, I think, is very important. And reporting statistical measures to include effect size is, is important. Um, it would be useful to have objective imaging measures to look at uh, where current is going in the brain. And ultimately, it's important to have objective empirical research to be able to validate um, the effects that we see, the costs and benefits of brain stimulation for us as a, as a culture and as a species. We need to make intelligent decisions about this, not emotional decisions, not decisions based on anxiety about something new, not decisions based on 
seeing Frankenstein as a kid and being a little scared by it, you know. People are very scared about electrical stimulation of the brain. And I don't believe it's really rational. It's based on irrational premises that aren't based on the data. We need good hard data and we need people to pay attention to it. And we as scientists need to disseminate that data in, a, in an even-handed, truthful way so that people will begin to recognize the possibilities. So what does the future hold? The current standard of care in medicine, it's expensive, sometimes it's dangerous, it needs to be improved. We're in a position to use the knowledge that we've gained in cognitive neuroscience applied through neuroenhancement to reduce illness and suffering. And in the end, what are we here for but to improve, improve the quality of life for everyone around us? That's why they pay us to do what we do. That's the job that society gives us. We can disregard it and get away with it. But if you want to be honest, why would, do we have our cushy tenure jobs? We're trying to make the world a better place. And we're trying, if you're in healthcare, trying to alleviate suffering. We need to take that seriously. Brain stimulation could give that to us. This will all be disruptive. It will change things. People making a lot of money might sacrifice some of that. They're not going to like it. They're going to attack us for that. We have to be prepared for that. We have to have solid science in hand to counter emotional arguments that are going to be made when they realize they're going to lose some of that third of a trillion dollars of income. And it's coming if it's not already here. I see it happening. There's another thing to worry about, and the, the Gartner group has this thing called a hype cycle that they've developed, and it, it, there's been other examples, it's just a good one. There's a technology trigger, what they call a technology trigger, and this hugely increased expectation immediately. Everyone's excited. Then people start to get critical and realize that excitement, some of it was unwarranted, and it, you get this trough of disillusionment. I've seen it with functional MRI, with PET scanning, and so on. You can track this for all the modalities that we know so well. Afterwards, it, it slopes back up again. Where are we? I think we're still more or less on this upward slope, and the trough of disillusionment is coming. <laughs> Beware, right? But this is, again, how humans behave. It's our species. We're not perfect, believe me. Um, it's how we do things. We get excited. We're excitable. But eventually we'll become rational and eventually it'll work out okay. The data I see is that it's very, potentially very useful. We have to keep working. But I think in the end, this will turn out to be very useful technology for us in a number of respects. Another thing, I just want to plug a couple things briefly. I put a draft website together and I haven't had a lot of time to work on it. But this concept of smaller medicine, cheaper, safer, more effective medicine, I want to get people to start thinking about developing medical technologies that aren't super expensive and that aren't super dangerous, but are effective. TDCS might be one example, mouth guards another, but they're there, they're out there, and I think we should be looking for them as opposed to avoiding them because they might be a little boring or we won't make as much money or whatever. We're spending too much money on this stuff. Too many people are getting hurt. Another thing, um, we're planning a brain stimulation education day um, at Human Brain Mapping in Hamburg, Germany. A few people in the audience have accepted uh, to give lectures. If you're interested, please attend, um, assuming it's accepted by the program committee. We're also planning a brain stimulation satellite meeting for the 2015 Human Brain Mapping Meeting in Honolulu. And again, if you're interested, please come. Um, I'll be getting in touch with many of you about attending. Um, but it's part of my effort, our effort, to bring imaging and stimulation together and keep it together. And one of my thoughts is, let's get imagers going to that meeting to come to our meeting, too. Thanks to a lot of people, many people are involved in the studies that I've talked about, many more people, even more than that. And thank you for listening. <laughs>